Well, it's my great pleasure now to welcome Wing Commander Leanne Woon from the Royal New Zealand Air Force. Welcome to our conversations about this uh, Lessons Learned conference. Y you've just given a, a fascinating paper as part of a panel on multi-agency disaster response, a, a presentation about three disasters in New Zealand and some of the lessons you've learned from that. Just remind us of the three big things that have happened to New Zealand. Sure. Well, unfortunately, we've had the uh, Pike River mining disaster where 29 miners were killed on the west coast. Then we had um, the Christchurch earthquake. There was one in September 2010. And then uh, the big one was really in February 2011, which is what I presented on today. At the February 2011 earthquake, it was um, technically actually an aftershock, but it was a magnitude 6.3. Uh, fortunately, there were 185 people killed and um, over 30 different nationalities involved in that earthquake and a huge, obviously, impact on New Zealand and, uh, and continues to be so today. And then the third uh, disaster was actually the um, grounding off the arena, the motor vessel arena, the trawler, um, in Tauranga on a reef, and that had a huge impact again as well. And as a result of those three major disasters, we've actually produced at Headquarters Joint Force New Zealand a uh, humanitarian aid a disaster relief book, Aid Memoir, which has got all the best practices and lessons learned from those three disasters. Um, and how we would respond to those, um, the response options available to Defence Force. Yes, so, uh, this book, you, uh, the Aid Memoir, what's the purpose of this book? The book is actually designed for Headquarters Joint Force New Zealand Defence Force planners. So it assists us when planning for a response, looking at um, the capability we've got available, the niche capabilities, our degrees of notice, and what the response options are available to us. It also outlines the um, different civil defence uh, responsibilities and the different structures. So where we, you know, as a supporting agency, what our roles are. And also has a range of checklists for about 10 or 12 different functional areas. So if you were assigned to be a liaison officer, um, for example, logistics liaison officer at a certain area, you would actually turn to that um, chapter in the book and you would see a list of items to be checked against to actually, questions to ask or things to be aware of before you actually get assigned that task. So this book is a giant set of lessons learned. It's exactly what this conference is about. Yes, yeah. Lessons learned from the New Zealand Defence Force perspective, um, yes. And it gives you best practices on what, what worked well and what hasn't worked for us. And did, did you work with people outside of the New Zealand Defence Forces in, in the development of this aid memoir? No, it's predominantly a Defence Force product. It's not a doctrinal publication, so we're not saying this is a doctrine going forward. This is just best practices and lessons identified or sometimes learnt on how we would do diff business differently going forward. So it's really to help our own people. Um, it is available to aid agencies and other government departments, but it's for a, a, a guidance only. It's not saying this is how you are to do business, but uh, this is a guidance. So if they're interacting with us, and some of the lessons we learnt was um, a fear of working with the military. You know, some one agency asked us, you know, would we take off our uniform and work with them? So again, it's breaking down those barriers and showing people, you know, how the military operate and what we would bring to the table as a supporting agency in a major disaster. That's a very interesting question. Would you take off your uniform when you're working with us? What did you take that from that qu query? I mean, I assume you won't. No, we won't. No, because that's that's what we bring. That's the strengths of what we bring. Um, so again, what we took from that is. The, um, the way we perhaps um, arrive at an agency and work with them, so it means we've got to engage more with agencies, you know, network with them, um, explain to them how we do operate, and also understand their processes and practices, you know, their culture, their ethos. Um, you know, we all will get there in the end, but the way um, the military might do it might, might be quite different to a, a civilian or a, another government agency. Yeah. <laughs> What's, I know you weren't personally involved in each of those three disasters, but you've got three very different things, an earthquake, a shipping disaster, and a mining disaster. Were there any common lessons that have been highlighted in your aid memoir? Um, there is, and what we learnt in our Christchurch earthquake was personnel tracking systems. So we had a lot of people on the ground, but we didn't actually know where they worked, and so if they'd been exposed to potentially um, hazardous substance or like asbestos and that, or had there been another earthquake, you know, who was actually, where were they located in the, in the city or at which parts? So um, we were lucky for, in some ways, for Operina, the, the grounding of the motor vessel, the um, trawler. We controlled the entry point, so when people arrived to actually do the beach cleanup or the oil spill or whatever part in logistics, um, uh, whatever disaster relief provide, assistance they provided, we would actually um, sign them in basically and then we'd actually know exactly where they worked and what part of the recovery operation they worked on so that uh, we knew who was, who was there at any one time. 
Um, so we've put in a, a system for that. Okay, now. so one key lesson is tracking your people, people on the site. Is there another key lesson that you, that you took away that's covered two or three of those disasters? Yes, end-to-end um, -end planning. So we work with, um, obviously, government agencies. Um, for example, for Christchurch again, we'd evacuate a lot of people and we would send them on our C-130, our military aircraft, say, from Christchurch to Auckland. But we were just transporting people. We weren't responsible for them when they arrived there. And so, for example, um, you know, if the elderly were being arriving there, you know, were their bed spaces available? Was there an ambulance there to pick them up? Were family there for perhaps migrants or displaced personnel to meet them? So in some cases, you know, we would have an aircraft load of people arriving, but there was no one at the other end um, to support them. Um, so we were left with managing that, and we, we can do that, but it's, um, it's not really our job to do that. So end-to-end -end planning, in a way, that drives you into relationship with government and non-government, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. But also understanding where our responsibilities are. I mean, we're not just going to um, put them on an aircraft and leave them uh, without any support. So again, that became our responsibility, working with those agencies and saying, you know, this is what we can provide, but when we get to the other end, it's, it's still your responsibility to, to then, you know, carry on with that support, you know, if they weren't ready for, to receive the elderly. There was a gentleman on your panel um, from the United States who talked about evacuations in relation to, I think, a, a volcanic eruption uh, and mentioned pets. Can you just speak to that? What was that issue and has that arisen for you? Um, his issue was um, when they had the NEO, the non-combatant evacuations, was actually evacuating the um, US citizens but also taking care of their pets, which they hadn't factored into their planning. Um, I'm not aware of that, um, certainly from the Christchurch quake. Um, incident, but for him it was like you know organising a flight for pets, and sort of pets were as a as a priority as much as the passengers because they were part of people's family and a very emotional issue. So, and from a military perspective, planning for that, you know, we might say, oh, pets, are, we can deal with pets later. But for obviously in that situation, well, he expressed to... it quite bluntly. He said we can euthanise them, but then they realised it was really a psychosocial or a mental health issue, and that it may be in a disaster situation the last thing the person actually had with whom they had an emotional connection. But again, something you wouldn't necessarily think of without an interagency communication. Uh, can I just ask you, one or two of the big challenges that uh, arose in this book that perhaps you hadn't thought about so much before, are there any other significant challenges in multi-agency response? Um, I guess it's just understanding the different cultures of different agencies um, and different ways of doing business. Um, for example, um, for military, we're very good at planning and running uh, command and control situations. So you might go to another agency. It may appear to be disorganised, but the way they do business may not be the way the military would. Not saying it's right or wrong. We'll all get there and get the ends and achieve the ends and the objective, but it might be a different way. So it's very hard for military to, to step back um, we are not the lead agency, we are a supporting agency, so we've got to be really cognisant that sometimes we've just got to let them go through their process and they'll get there and support, support them in their planning, their coordination um, and of that. Just before I let you go, Wing Commander, what do you hope to gain from being part of all this? Sure. Um, well, I'm actually new to the lessons learnt area, so this is the first time I've been to this conference, so for me personally, an opportunity to learn um, how other organisations work um, and also create a lot of networks so that, and already through the presentation, a lot of people coming up saying, you know, um, just setting up contacts with the New Zealand Defence Force and establishing those relationships so that we can share information and learn from each other. We're very good, I believe, at identifying lessons, but actually the learning is that systemic changes we need to be doing. So it's been quite um, invigorating seeing some of the challenges we're facing in New Zealand Defence Force or Headquarters Joint learning lessons is not unique to us, so that's validating that, but also looking at some of the systems the other agencies are using to learn lessons and do that systemic changes, which really is cultural changes in some cases. Uh, because I was thinking that it's about methodology and tools, isn't it? And at your senior level, you'd be interested in what NATO is doing or what the US is doing or what Australia is doing. Yeah, and looking at the doctrinal publications, and we have actually taken a lot of the, uh, the intellectual property from the Headquarters One book, um, Adaptive Warfare Division in Australia and actually we're using a lot of their processes to actually set up our own uh, lessons learnt uh, philosophy and framework as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Great. Thank you.